Rhaid da fenyw i di Colin Williams, dwi'n athro yn adran y Gymraeg ym Mhrif Ysgol Caerdydd yng Nghymru, yn arbennig o ar bolisiaeth ac ar hawliau ieithyddol, ac yn dysgu cymeraethau rhwng gwneud fel Cymru, Werddon, Canada, De Affrica, yng Nglyn Arffodd maen nhw'n trin ieithoedd llefrifol ac hawliau dynestiaid. Yn, yn rheidol dwi'n deirydwr ac gyda chefndir yng Nglyd Oedd Rhyngwladol. Professor Williams, good afternoon. And to you, sir. Glad to have you here in, in Canada, in New Brunswick. Right. Uh, could you just, for, uh, for general purposes, uh, tell us where Wales is and describe the linguistic landscape of Wales? Right. Well, if you've got a mental map of the United Kingdom, Wales is the bit to the west of England that sticks out into the Irish Sea. So it's the midpoint between Ireland and England. Historically, much of southern Britain would have been called Welsh, Britannia, Brythonic, the language that was spoken there. And so the standard theory is that Wales is comprised of people who were forced to the west when the Norman, Angles, Viking invasions happened. And in essence, it's one of the original Celtic languages. So it's a small nation. How many people? About 3.06 million, according to the census of 2011. Of those, about 560,000 uh, claim to be able to speak Welsh. That's about 19% of the current population. Of those born in Wales, about 23% uh, claim to be able to speak Welsh. But Wales, being it's um, two hours from London, the Welsh border, um, suffers or enjoys close proximity with England, depending on your um, political point of view. Um, so effectively, you've got a large degree of in and out migration from the rest of the United Kingdom to Wales. Um, so it's hard to talk about um, Wales as a separate unit, because unlike Scotland, which is physically quite distinct and distant from England, Wales is basically England's closest neighbour and there's a great deal of functional interrelationship. So the largest English cities like Manchester, Liverpool, Chester, Birmingham, and Bristol all have a catchment area to the west which attracts Welsh commuters, Welsh shoppers, Welsh football supporters. So much of the eastern part of Wales is dominated by its proximity to England and it would be very hard to separate out. So, so if we look at the, the Welsh language, are there regions in Wales where it's more dominant than in others? Very much so. If you divide Wales into four quarters, the northwest of Wales, which is called Gwynedd, and the southwest of Wales, historically, are the heartlands of the Welsh language. Uh, partly because of the settlement pattern, much of the central part of Wales has a high mountain region, like a massif central, and to the west of that, it's claimed that Welsh settlement was protected by geography, by hinterlands, and then the southeast and the northeast, because they're closer to England, have a large anglicised population. And when Wales was an industrialising country, roughly in the 18th and early 19th century, most of the immigration came from England and from Europe to the industrial areas of South Wales, where coal, steel and iron was um, in the main forged. cities in Wales, there's Cardiff. Cardiff and Swansea, Swansea. are the two main cities. Um, historically, in the modern period, very English, uh, because their whole commercial raison d'etre was to link London with South Wales and then beyond that to Ireland. And if you think of it in terms of spatial awareness, Wales has two main motorways and two main railway lines. They run along the north coast and they run along the south coast. They're designed to protect economic investments, but also to link Ireland with London. There's a very little internal communication. There's no major motorway, north and south. There's no internal rail system. So the whole mindset of modern Wales is to look east to England and west to Ireland. Is there a, a reason for that, with, with a linguistic reason for, for that? No, or? most of it is to do with commercial and commercial strategic only. developments of the British Empire. Uh, to link Ireland with the rest of Britain, you go through Wales. So if we look at the Welsh language today, how vibrant is the Welsh language in, in Wales? Depends where you come from. Um, I come from the most anglicised part of Wales, a little town called Barry near the capital. And to me, the Welsh language... And the capital being Cardiff. Cap capital is Cardiff, that's right. Uh, the Welsh language is a half full bottle. Because I've seen growth in bilingual education, in television, growth in legislation, growth in creative drama, etc. 
But if you came from the north and west of Wales, where you're used to Welsh being the dominant community language, you might see attrition, you might see um, outmigration of the young and the well-educated, you might see a diminution of public services, access to dentists, the closure of local libraries, the closure of local health clinics, and with that obviously a decline in the language. So for people in that part of Wales, the bottle is half empty, mm -hmm. because their childhood in the 50s was 100% Welsh. Now it's very much 50% balanced, bilingual, fragile um, act. So much of your perspective is not based on statistics, it's based on your lived reality. Your reality. Uh, when people look at Great Britain, they tend to, certainly in Canada, people that don't know much about Great yeah. Britain will look at it and will see Great Britain as being a centralized country. Yes. Or if they, they know a little bit about devolution, they'll, they'll know that there was devolution to Scotland yes. and to Northern Ireland. Yeah. Uh, people would be surprised, I believe, to, 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 to see that there's also been very important devolution of powers to, to Wales. Yes. Could you just expand on that? Yes, when the, um, the first initial devolution debates were in the 70s, when the Labour government was in charge, and a referendum was held in Scotland and Wales, and they were narrowly defeated in Scotland, but hugely defeated in Wales. So people, so said people no, were opposed to a devolution? Very much so, no. The Nationalist Party, which had animated this whole drive, didn't want to accept the devolution proposal because it was too weak. The Labour Party didn't want to accept it because they feared that if there was devolution to Scotland and Wales, their two historical industrial strongholds, the Labour Party would never gain power in England. So for a federal British electoral map, the dynamism of the Labour Party is industrial South Wales, the central belt of Scotland, and the declining industrial towns of the north of England. So if Labour concentrated its efforts in Scotland and Wales, England would never become a Labour returning government. So there's a great deal of internal opposition to the notion of dismantling Britain for fear of the Labour Party never being in control again. And then that died a death, huge disappointment for those who voted for it. And then in the 90s, um, almost ironically perhaps as a result of conservative one-party rule for 18 years, devolution was on the cards again. It was hugely successful in Scotland and only slightly successful in Wales. In other words, less than 51% of the population of Wales voted for devolution. But interestingly, Welsh speakers voted for devolution 7 to 1 because they saw devolution as an opportunity to become self-governing along the road to freedom of independence. And they also saw a European argument that the 100 nations of Europe, the small nations, the unrepresented nations of Europe, if you like, Catalonia, Basque, Flanders, Wales, Scotland, could huddle together in a regionalised, reformed, federal European state. And so there's a huge European um, emphasis on devolution. It wasn't just about British constitutional tinkering. It was about re reinventing, if you like, uh, le sans drapeau de Europe. It was a, a revitalization of European diversity. So devolution, as we know it today, happened in around 19, 1999. 1999. And powers were granted to the Assembly in, yes. in Cardiff. In Scotland, you had a restitution of the Scottish Parliament, mm -hmm. which had united into the two crowns in 1707. But in Wales and in Northern Ireland, national assemblies, not parliaments, national. were instituted. And there's a difference between the two? There is, because in Scotland, by restituting the Parliament, you could have primary legislative powers. Okay. Whereas in Wales, you had Don't. secondary legislative powers only in the first tranche. Then, because the Assembly proved its own ability to handle certain policy fields, the Government of Wales Act, which was a 2006 Act, United Kingdom Westminster Act, identified 20 policy fields, which over time could be gradually transferred from Westminster to Cardiff. The argument being that until devolution had embedded itself, it was a, an experiment, but over six or seven years it had proved itself um, eminently workable. And because you had um, a Labour government in power and a Labour government in Cardiff, there was a great deal of modus vivendi that there was an operating system. So gradually there was an assumption that education, language, roads, town and country planning could be devolved to Wales and primary legislative power relating to those fields, could also be instituted. So in language and education, primary uh, legislative power has been... De devolved to Cardiff. To, to, 
So the Welsh Assembly makes decisions in those fields. And would you say that devolution that had as a, a, a positive impact on the renaissance of the Welsh language or the... Yeah, well, not just the Welsh language, but the Welsh nation. The Welsh three, nation. three things I would say as a personal citizen. First of all, it was an exciting time mm -hmm. and young people were captured with their imagination that for the first time in our modern history, we could make our own decisions, which weren't necessarily dictated by London or big industrial cities in England. Secondly, there were opportunities, of course, for employment at home. The general drift of most people, including myself, was to leave Wales as soon as you had your degree. In my case, I came to Canada, and I went to England, and I went to America to work in universities. So there was an opportunity at least to create um, a slightly more vibrant Welsh economy, mainly in the public sector initially, but also in the creative design, in television, in the arts, and in um, the commercial side of life. And then thirdly, because devolution was also accompanied by modernization of Welsh cities, um, long established ports had declined, old industries had gone, so a lot of money had been spent on reviving Cardiff and Swansea and Newport. Mm -hmm. So there was a vibrancy, there was a buzz, there was an excitement, there was a chemistry about devolution, um, which I think is, is still there. Uh, there's, an, there's an assumption that for the most important things that life is about, we make our own decisions. Mm -hmm we're not dictated to, or we don't have the, the cast-offs from a Westminster or a Brussels and, and, and how did that impact on uh, the protection or the Well, for the first time, the Welsh language, language went up the agenda. Uh, I was part of a group that set the terms of agreement or the terms of reference for the operation of the Assembly, and from day one, it was a bilingual Assembly. So of the 60 Assembly members, 19 in the first election were Welsh speakers, and a large number of political leaders and civil servants realised very quickly that it paid to learn Welsh. Mm. They had two audiences, television and committee work. And today I would argue that most of the political leaders of the parties in Wales can hold an interview in Welsh, mm. are competent in Welsh, they've been tutored to learn Welsh because the whole scale of their political realm has become more Welsh focused as opposed to British or European focused. So it pays politicians to be seen to be proactively Welsh. Mm -hmm. And they use the Welsh language in very the assembly. Very much so, very much so, in committee work and in civil service work, etc. And in, in education, if we take education for example, how did that change the, the, the use of the Welsh language in well, education? Well, that program? happened prior to devolution, yeah. but in the 1950s and 60s, most Welsh medium schools, the equivalent of your immersion schools in parts of Canada, were very much parent-driven and then local authorities reacted often reluctantly to the establishment of a new Welsh medium school. So very small, but highly charged, very good academic results. But then under the Conservative government in the 1980s, who were concerned that English culture was being diluted by immigration from the new Commonwealth, from Europe, from the rest of the world, a national curriculum was established in England and Wales, which had four key subjects, English, mathematics, a science subject, and a core humanities subject. And those mandatory core subjects were essential for all public schools in England. In the Welsh context, a Education Act of 1988 added Welsh as a core subject. And for the first time in modern Welsh history, all children in Wales were taught Welsh. Prior to 1988, only a minority of children were formally instructed in Welsh. Catholic schools, Anglican schools, and English schools near the border with England were not required by law to teach Welsh. So whole generations of students had not even heard Welsh formally. But since 1988, every child born in Wales and resident in Wales has a formal instruction in Welsh to different levels of threshold, of course. That has two huge implications. First of all, for the parents, it takes away some of the suspicion as to what the Welsh language is about, a dividing language between them and us the minority and the majority. But secondly, for many students, having been tutored in Welsh and passed exams in Welsh, they're now active citizens who are bilingual. They may not be as active as you want them to be, but they have the capacity for the first time ever to learn Welsh and to use Welsh. So that has a knock-on effect on culture, on job opportunities, on skills, and on television viewing. So that it's much more normal now to have a bilingual conversation mm -hmm. than it would be when I was young, when I was young if there was a non-Welsh speaker in the room, you switched to English. 
But today, the assumption is, you speak Welsh, I speak Welsh, let's speak Welsh. So about 40% of children aged 5 to 11 now are enrolled in Welsh medium primary schools. At each stage, age 11, age 16, age 18, the numbers drop. Um, so if that tide of enthusiasm for Welsh that parents have aged five for their children were to be carried through to the university system, the language revival would have been wonderfully secured about 20 years ago. Is there a reason why? The there are two reasons. In non-Welsh speaking homes, which are the majority of homes in Wales, remember that only less than 20% of people actually speak Welsh, but in non-Welsh speaking homes, many parents send their children to a Welsh primary school as a guarantee that they acquire a certain fluency in Welsh. But the parents themselves, of course, can't help with homework. They can't help with reading skills. They can't help with writing skills because they're not fluent in Welsh. So when the serious student experience happens between age 11 and 18, especially if you're keen to go to university or to a higher education, the parents can do one of two things. They can either trust the system and allow their student children to go on into the Welsh medium high school system, or they can relocate their children to an English medium high school with a Welsh stream. Mm -hmm. And then the parents have more control of their input into helping the child's education. You made reference to university. Is there a possibility of having education in Welsh yes. at university? Yes. Um, until quite recently, the Federal University of Wales was a national university with seven colleges throughout Wales. And two of those colleges in Bangor and Aberystwyth, the north and west Wales, since the 60s were designated colleges where investment was made in Welsh medium theology, geography, history, law, the Welsh language, of course, mathematics. And students who wanted to have a Welsh medium university education went to those two colleges. In the late 1990s, that whole federal system broke down as a result of university competition. So all those colleges became independent universities, as mine did, Cardiff University. It's a free for all but students follow high academic standing and provision. So my university, Cardiff, in the last 10 years, has changed from being an area where hardly any Welsh was used to an area where Welsh has been highlighted in significant departments. Mm -hmm. So in your context, the law school in Cardiff University, which is ranked within the top six or seven in Britain, uh, eight years ago started teaching through the medium of Welsh tutorials only. Mm -hmm so that law could be taught in Welsh. Today I'm happy to say that 60 students enrol every year and do their complete course, the core course anyway, in Welsh. And that's funded by um, something called the Coleg Cymraeg Cenedlaethol, the Welsh National College, which is a government invent in, uh, incentive to get non-traditional subjects used in the Welsh language. So, so if they're uh, scholar in, in Welsh, it means that the laws in Wales are also adopted bilingually? Yes, but there's not a huge tradition of that before devolution. Okay. But with devolution, and especially now since we have primary legislative power, there's a parallel development of the law as almost a, a subset of English law, if you like. Um, and students will want to go into private practice and to, to use their Welsh knowledge in the delivery of services in the legal profession. Can you use the Welsh language in court? Yes, in 1942, right in the middle of the Second World War, the UK government passed a Welsh Language Courts Act, which gave the right to jurors and to a trial by jury in Welsh. It's used um, episodically, I would say, um, but ironically, from a language policy point of view, the very first domain within which Welsh language rights were given were in trials. You might expect it to be education, yes. but it was the law system in the middle Do of the war. Do judges in uh, understand Welsh? Or? Yes. Not, they don't have to, to be appointed, but several do. And several are very eminent, as you know from your own yes. uh, education experience. And is there an appeal court in Wales, or do you have to go to London? London, largely. So, yes. so the case is in Welsh. Yes. If you appeal to London, yes. how do you, do you deal with it in London? Well, often there hasn't been a large tradition. The, the tactic in the 60s was if you were convicted and you made an appeal, you could be tried in Carnarvon in North Wales or in Cardiff or in South East Wales generally, and arrangements would be made. But outside that, um, no such arrangements are obliged in London. Now, now there's also, a, 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 I believe it's called the Welsh Language Act. Yes. 
Uh, could you just elaborate yes. a little bit on that? Um, most of the, unlike other Celtic countries, I would say Ireland and Scotland and Brittany, most of the activism for the promotion of the Welsh language has come from parents, from student bodies, and from very well organised civil society action groups. So there's a huge history of protest, of um, resistance against the state in Wales, a very radical um, socialist tradition, you might say, and increasingly perhaps in the modern period, nationalist as well. In the 60s and 70s, there was a strong movement to have Welsh language legislation to protect the rights of parents to have their children educated in Welsh medium schools by local authority. Rather than the local authority decide, the national government, the British government, should protect the right, of the anticipated right anyway, of parents to have their children educated in Welsh. And so there was a strong pressure right throughout the 60s and 70s to have a Welsh Language Act. Two bills were presented by members of parliament in the 70s, and that took quite a lot of um, attention, but they were never passed. There were private members' bills. But in 1993, the Conservative government passed the Welsh Language Act. Very much supported by Welsh Conservatives and by a cross-party Welsh MPs uh, select committee. The two provisions of the Act were to establish a government promotional body called the Welsh Language Board to promote Welsh activities in the public sector and across the domains of leisure and youth but not the private sector and not the voluntary sector. And then to guarantee the development of a whole swathe of bilingual public services in the health, education, local government, tax, and other domains, a language scheme was introduced. And this is a negotiated program of action between a local authority, an institution, a public body, and the Welsh Language Board, who proctored and regulated the scheme it was agreed over a period of time and they were tutored how to prepare the schemes by civil servants in the Welsh Language Board. To date, about 552 schemes have been established. Some of them are in their third iteration because they last for a set defined period. And they've been working fairly well? Uh, from the citizens' point of view, they've been exceptionally good because they've normalised the Welsh language as a vehicle of communication for public administration in Wales. And there's been parallel for a standard of services. Yes, there's been a parallel development of uh, training civil servants, local authority, um, health authority people to um, develop Welsh. In the more higher percentage parts of Wales, where 60, 80 percent of people speak Welsh, which is North and West Wales, the language schemes are hugely comprehensive. They cover everything that the local council does. Everything, uh, health, everything. Uh, everything. Uh, but in the south and eastern Wales, where perhaps less than 30% of the population speak Welsh, there's a more limited set of agreed criteria which have to be fulfilled. Mm. I did a study of this with others, and we found out that the schemes were largely influential in changing attitudes and behaviour of public servants and citizens in demanding services, but they were inconsistent in their application mm. and implementation. So you couldn't guarantee, you, had, you didn't have a right that a public servant would always serve you in Welsh. Um, typically, there'd be a whole litany of excuses that I'm sure you're familiar with as Francophonie in Canada, why a service wouldn't be fully available. But when it worked well, it worked exceptionally well. The difficulty, of course, is that the language schemes themselves were geographically and institutionally limited. So you might have two institutions in the same town operating a different scheme. So the citizen didn't know how far to progress their complaints or their expectations. So the Welsh Language Board had a complaint system which works very, or did work very well, but it was a non-elected, quasi non-governmental body, a quango, of which there were many under the Conservative government. And the Welsh Labour government, in the middle of the 2000s, 2005, declared that all the nine quangos that had been established by the Conservative government in the 1990s would be abolished. Mm -hmm. So they included big developments like the Welsh Economic Development Board, which attracted inward investment from America, Germany, China to Wales, but was not a publicly accountable body in the way in which a Department of the Economy would be. It abolished the Welsh Tourist Board, and it set in notion 
the argument that the Welsh Language Board would be abolished in time. And as a result, the language schemes began to slow because elements within the system were just waiting for the board to disappear before investing in new training schemes for staff or in implementing new services. Uh, the one element of the service which wasn't covered by the Welsh Language Act by law were the crown bodies of the UK departments of government, the Home Office, the Foreign Office, the big departments of welfare, of pension, the police service. But they could voluntarily submit themselves to produce a voluntary language scheme and the Welsh Language Board spent a lot of time nurturing this and asking for minimal services to be provided for prisoners, for, for pensioners, for insurance, for accident and insurance purposes. And so for the first time you had a Welsh passport, a passport which was English, Welsh, Gaelic and Irish. As a result of this pressure brought to bear by language schemes, if you were a prison officer or a prisoner, you had rights of duty of expectation that some of your um, information about prison life or about health and hospital life um, could be guaranteed by these big departments of state. Mm -hmm. So that was a big plus. Um, so the Welsh language appeared over time uh, to be normal, which is exactly the whole point of the scheme. The difficulty, of course, was that there was not a minimum national standard. And so when the Welsh Language Board was abolished in 2012, it was replaced in part by a Language Commission's Office. Okay, it's the modeled, Language Commission's Office. I modelled on Canada and Ireland. Appeared in 2012. 2012. Prior to that, a very important strategic and legal um, development was the Welsh language measure of 2011, mm -hmm. which was part of an early raft of legislation which the Government of Wales Act of 2006 had hinted at, whereby in the 20 defined fields of policy, the Welsh Assembly could produce primary legislation. And of the three early domains, the Welsh language was one of these three, and a huge investment of time and energy by politicians and civil servants and civil society in Wales was put into allowing the Welsh language to be one of the new fields by which primary legislation in the Cardiff Assembly mm -hmm. could be developed. So there's a great deal of support for this measure, even by people who weren't necessarily well-wishers to the Welsh language, because they saw it as symbolic of the transfer of powers from Westminster to Cardiff, and then obviously a change in the constitutional arrangements of the United Kingdom. So the Welsh language measure of 2011 uh, superseded the arrangements of the Welsh Language Act of 1993. It was a Cardiff-based piece of legislation, not a Westminster-based piece of legislation. It applied to Wales only, not to England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, whereas the Welsh Language Act had purchase in other parts of the United Kingdom. And it um, divided the Welsh Language Board's functions into two. It gave the policy remit to government, so for the first time ever in our history, a department of government was responsible for the Welsh language. It's responsible also for the, for the language schemes? Yes, they still exist until they're supplemented in time mm -hmm. by standards. And it created a Welsh language commissioner mm -hmm. whose functions are fairly similar to the federal um, Canadian Welsh, uh, official languages, but without the bite, without okay. the real um, teeth that you might have here. In, in what words? It doesn't, uh, she doesn't have any powers to, to, to bring the department to court? Really? Yes, she does. She does. Um, but how does she know? Does not have by any? taking, there's a case just this last week where the national insurance schemes in Britain weren't obliging the language schemes, uh, they were, in other words, they were not fulfilling their duties. So at this very moment, the Welsh Language Commissioner has taken the national insurance, the P Department of National Pensions and Insurance, to the Supreme Court in England, or in, in England and Wales. But um, why are you saying she doesn't have as much teeth as well, the Canadian Commissioner? Well, because you'd expect a language commissioner to defend rights. And unfortunately, in Wales, we have no rights. We have expectations. We have freedom to use Welsh. We have the recognition that Welsh is an official language for the first time ever. But there's no suite of defined rights that can be pointed to. So the citizen is not empowered to say, these are my regulations. Are rights. there any definitions of freedoms and expectations? Uh, there are rhetorical um, discussions about what freedom means. Um, but there's no 
defined set of rights for the individual at the moment. But part of the Welsh language measures long-term implication is to develop a suite of rights in time. And if you understand the hegemony of the English language and English court system, you realise how reticent lawyers are to develop a whole new field of law without political and judicial backing. So it's very much a softly, softly approach at home, whereby the next generation of people may very well have defined language and educational rights. But historically in Britain, as you know, and certainly in England and Wales, individual rights to language have not been well received. Although there's been a huge debate about it um, under different agendas, the equality legislation is the best example, the human rights legislation, the European uh, human rights legislation. Uh, the judicial system in Britain, certainly in England and Wales, is very cautious in speculating about what these rights might be, even though politicians and civil society have presented draft bills and draft pieces of legislation that politicians in time could adopt. But I see the next generation of politicians in Wales um, obliging specific rights for education, for health care, for delivery of public services. So I'm very hopeful that in my lifetime there will be a, a basic fundamental suite of rights that can be acted upon in the courts if they are um, ignored. If I was going to ask you, going to, towards a, a conclusion, uh, what are the strongest parts of the Welsh language man management scheme or, and its weakest part? Right. What would they be? The weakest part is that we are facing the most powerful language in the world, English. English. So the social psychological normalcy of a British citizen is to assume English is sufficient. And if you were to learn another language, far better to learn French or Italian or Chinese or Japanese. Why waste money, investment and time on a dead language, Welsh? It's not dead, it's vibrant. So I see the weakness being a social psychological adjustment to the reality of lived bilingualism. And that's even by Welsh speakers, who've for centuries been colonised into thinking that their language is insufficient for the modern world. So if there is a weakness, it's a weakness not to take for granted what's already available. Were all Welsh speakers to take the opportunities already available, there'd be a huge vibrancy. But if I take you to one example, Banks have ATMs machines, which are available in Welsh and English, also in German and French and Italian. Only 7% on average of Welsh speakers operate the ATM in Welsh. Why? They fear that if they make a mistake, they lose their money. Now, you and I would say that's irrational, but this is normal behaviour. If English is so dominant, any deviation from that hegemonic position is a risk. So a whole generation of people, younger than 30, have to be taught to trust the system being bilingual. So the second weakness then is the weakness of the capacity of people who operate the system to provide a sufficiently equally balanced, high quality service which satisfies the customer. Because a rational person, if they deem the Welsh version to be inferior to the English, even though by law they should be equal, but if the actual experience, the lived reality is secondary, you switch to English. Mm. And that's quite logical. Because who wants to be given a poor service? or an inconsistent service. So that's really the weakness to me. Social psychological and lived daily reality in anglicised areas. The strength is that the, the ambition of the Welsh-speaking population of Wales is now shared in part by the whole of the population of Wales. Even the 80% who don't speak Welsh have a huge pride in bilingualism. It's proxy bilingualism. They may themselves not have been taught in school or by their parents, because for three generations Welsh wasn't transmitted in the family since 1920 till about 1960. But they guarantee that their children will benefit from the new provision. So that's why Welsh schools, in many parts of the area where I live, which is the most populous part of South East Wales, most of the Welsh high schools, 90% of the children come from homes where neither parent speaks Welsh. And several of the parents are, are ethnic origin parents, Pakistan, Indian, African, who are attracted to the schools by the high academic standards. Not love of Welsh culture, or Welsh poetry, or Welsh music, but the skill set that bi- or trilingual students can gain in such excellent schools. And that bodes well for me for the future, because instead of being a minority language, 
it'll be a language of choice for a diversified population. And in many ways, to me, that's a multicultural context where Welsh can be rooted. And the most um, significant part of this whole revival of Welsh in my lifetime is the European dimension. Because many parts of Europe, as you know, Catalonia, the Basque Country, Wales, Ireland, Flanders, increasingly the small nations that were in the last enlargement encouraged to join the European Union, Slovenia, Slovakia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, less than five million people are more likely to encourage Basque or Welsh as legitimate member states or legitimate partners because they are no longer themselves subject to the hegemonic power of English or French or German. So this unity and diversity rhetoric of the European Union can hit home and give us some advantages that we are no longer just seen as England's poor neighbour, but we're part of the rich tapestry, if you like, of European heritage. And so that has a huge psychological um, adjustment process for young people who are proud to be Welsh, just as Catalans or Basques or Slovenes are proud to be Slovene. They have the fluency of German or Italian or English or French for big business and international travel, but they also have the comfort of knowing their own mother tongue or their own language and of choosing different sets of vibrant domains, culture and pop music and art and literature and sport and entertainment to enjoy their life. So for me, the quality of life in Wales has improved markedly as bilingualism begins to go through the system, mainly as a result of education. So for me, the, the future is very rosy if we can maintain the dynamism, the creative dynamism, the structural tension, if you like, of living the world through at least two fluent languages. All people who speak Welsh are also hugely fluent in English, of course. So in no way they're disadvantaged. And most Welsh people uh, who have gone through a school system tend to learn a third language, and whether it be French or Spanish, uh, because they're already bilingual, um, don't have the hang-ups of a monolingual about being trilingual. They may not be perfect in French or Spanish or Italian, but they're willing to give it a go. And many of them, of course, master that in time, especially if they migrate or move with their jobs to other parts of Europe. So to me, psychologically, the small nations of Europe have not reached the sun, but they're being warmed up gradually to believe themselves as legitimate, well-respected citizens of a multicultural Europe. And to me, that's the most promising sign. Professor Williams? Thank you very much for that uh, pleasure. And certainly I hope that we'll be able to meet in the near future and do a follow-up on this. I hope so myself. Thank you very much.